What does it look like when you leave your first love? It means that you have to find time for him when you have time for other things. Most folk don't have to find time for, for this show or that show because it's understood that when that time comes and that show is on, I'm there. The reason why we have to find time for God is because he's not first love. He's when I get around to your love. It has to do with priority. He, he wants to know he's first, that he has been relationally prioritized, not just programmatically included. First love is where there is a fire for him. The first church we come to is the church at Ephesus. To appreciate and understand Ephesus, all you have to do is understand New York. Ephesus was the New York of Asia Minor, now known as Turkey. Ephesus was the center of commerce, of culture, of civic uh, focus, of fashion. If you wanted to go on vacation, Ephesus was the place to go. It was a tourist city. It was well known throughout Asia as the place to go. It was like a Wall Street. It, it, it dealt in significant financial matters because of its strategic location. It was also known for idolatry. The church at Ephesus, where you get the book of Ephesians out of. That's the book written to the church at Ephesus. The story of the church's beginning, feel free to read it sometime, is Acts chapter 19, of how in the midst of sorcery and witchcraft and economics, people got saved and the church was established. And it is expressed to us in Acts 19 about the energy, excitement, and challenges that face this brand new church. But here in the book of Revelation, he is not writing because all is well. He is writing because of a situation that needed to be addressed for people who wanted to be overcomers, as I hope that we do. He makes it clear in the first verse that this was written for the angel of that house that is God's messenger, the word angel from the Greek word angelos means messenger, that the messenger, the pastor if you will, was to proclaim this message to the congregation at Ephesus Bible Fellowship. And if you and I will hear what he has to say, he that hath an ear, let him hear, verse 7 says, then you are on your way to being an overcomer, an overruler of that which is ruling over you. Now he first wants you to know, according to verse 1, that the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven lampstands, says this. So before he says anything, he wants to let you know where he's walking. He says he's walking among the seven lampstands. That's the seven churches. So right now, as we gather in our congregational meeting today, there is an unseen visitor. Jesus Christ is walking up and down the aisles of this worship service. You cannot see him because he's here in spirit, not in body, but he's very much there. And he says, he that walks among the seven lampstands says this. And the first phrase he says is, I know. So he wants you to know as he passes by your pew, I know you and I know you. I am well aware of what your ministry has to offer. You are a serving church. You're not only a serving church, but I also know verse 2 says your toil. The Greek word for toil means to labor to the point of exhaustion. I see you sweating. I see your overtime. I see you huffing and puffing 
to get the ministry done. So you don't only do stuff, you go overboard in the doing of stuff. Your toil, you, you are tireless in ministry activity, and I'm, I'm, I'm very much aware of that. You're not only a serving church, you are then a sacrificing church. You go overboard. In addition to that, I know, he says, verse 2, your perseverance. I know that you don't quit when the going gets tough because you are a steadfast church. When, when times are hard, you keep going. You don't throw in the towel just because you may not be feeling it today. I'm well aware of your longevity. I'm conscious of your 40 years. Not only that, I am also well aware that you do not tolerate evil men and you test them who call themselves apostles and are not. You are a separated church. That is, you are orthodox in theology and doctrine. You test things to see whether they are consistent or inconsistent with the Bible. You are a Bible-teaching, Bible-believing, Bible-quoting, Bible-toting church. You're serving, you're sacrificing, you're steadfast, you're separated, you're suffering. You are uh, a model congregation, and I know it. But, the commendation now turns to a criticism or a condemnation. But I have this against you. You have left your first love. Wait a minute. Jesus, you just told me five things that you like about me, about Ephesus Bible Fellowship. Jesus says, I've seen, I've seen your commendable attributes, but I have this one thing against you. You have left your first love. So evidently, you can be a serving church and a serving Christian and have left your first love. Evidently, you can be a sacrificing church and a sacrificing Christian and have left your first love. You can be a steadfast church and a steadfast Christian and have left your first love. You can be a separated church and a separated Christian and have left your first love. You can be a suffering church and a suffering Christian and still have left your first love. So evidently, you can be doing right stuff and be in wrong relationship. To love God is to passionately pursue God's pleasure. To love God is to passionately pursue God's pleasure. But here's the problem, because I am sure there were believers in Ephesus who says, I, I, I love the Lord. Oh, but that's not his complaint that they don't love him. His complaint is they don't love him first. You have left your first love. Now, you may still love me, but you no longer love me first. Let me explain something about God that um, we all need to grab. We need to get this one. There are certain things God can't do. So let's get this straight. We got this thing, God can do anything. Well, not quite. Certain things he just can't do. God can't lie, the Bible says. By two immutable things, it's impossible for God to lie. So he can't lie. God can't sin. Uh, God can't act contrary to his nature, for then he would no longer be immutable, the unchanging God. God cannot stop existing because he's eternal. So he can't do that. There are some things he cannot do. Let me tell you something else God can't do. He can't be second. He cannot be second. Whenever God is made second to anything, even if they are good things, 
is unacceptable. Because he is in a class by himself. In the beginning, God. Before there was anything, there was God. The Bible says over and over again, what's the first commandment? You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. What does it say about Jesus Christ that he might have first place in everything? Paul says in 1 Timothy, when you come before God, first of all, raise holy hands, men, before the Lord. Do it first. When it comes to giving, God says, give to the Lord the first fruits of what he's given you. All through the Bible, this thing of first, 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 first. Because God assumes if he's not first, he must not be worthy. God demands to be first in our affection, in our attention, in our priority. He demands to be first because that's what he is. And when he is no longer first and has been repositioned with something or someone in place of him, you've just created an idol because you've made something else first. And whatever is first becomes your God. So now God has competition in your life. He's not saying you don't love me. He's saying you don't love me first. That I am not your priority and I don't know how to be second. We individually and corporately have often committed the sin of making ministry for him more important than relationship with him and the cost has been great in our spiritual experience of him. He says you've left your first love. You've compromised religion for relationship. And you've left me. And you know the bad part about it? We've left him and don't even know we've gone. What does it look like when you leave your first love? It means that you have to find time for him when you have time for other things. The reason why we have to find time for God is because we don't want that time. So we got to fit it in when nothing else is competing with it. That's because he's not first love. He's when I get around to your love. When I get around to you, I'll spend some time in prayer. When I get around to you, I'll spend some time in your word just meditating on you. When I get around to it, I'll spend some time just giving thanks for what you've already done and not just asking you for what I want you to do. I'm going to do it because you are first. And that mean, may mean I have to get up a little earlier for you to be first with my day. So what do we do about this? And why will it matter? Verse 5 tells you what to do. Three things. He says, remember from where you have fallen. The three R's. The first one he says, I want you to remember. Remember. Remember how it was, O Cliff, when you didn't have all these buildings and all these programs and all these members and remember back there when you were just in a house and you had to depend on me for everything you, you go back to that time when you didn't have to manage all this and have all this and all you had was me you, you remember that you remember saying when you first got saved you didn't know anything but John 3.16 and you just knew one little hymn, you couldn't, you couldn't wave your hand in the air like you just don't care. You didn't have all of that. All you knew was your sins were forgiven. You were on your way to heaven because you had come to Jesus Christ. You didn't have much. You, you, all you had was me. You better remember. 
Remember where you came from. Because you ain't always been up here. You haven't always been on Camp Wisdom. You haven't always been doing this. You weren't always blessed like you are now. He says, remember. Remember when I'm the one that mattered most. Second hour, he says, repent. Okay, there's only one thing you repent of in the Bible, and that's sin. It's the only thing you ever call to repent of, and that's sin. So guess what? Leaving your first love is sin. It's not just a bad habit. It's not just a mistake. When the relationship becomes secondary to the program, you're living in sin. I'm living in sin. We collectively are living in sin when the relationship is secondary to the program. He's not just calling it, oh, my, I got to get my priorities together. No, you got to get your sin fixed. Because he says repent. You only repent of sin. So he doesn't review this just as a scheduling issue. He views it as a sin issue. that I am no longer the priority in your life. You have programmed me to be second. And all the programs are wonderful. He says, you must repent. You must turn. You must turn. John 14, 21 is a powerful verse. He says, if you, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And to the one who loves me, watch this, I will disclose myself to him. Whoa. I will talk to him. I will show him or her. I will reveal myself. The reason why we're not hearing from God, the reason why we're not getting guidance from God, the reason why we're not experiencing victory from God is because he doesn't feel free to disclose himself to somebody who's going to treat him second. He drives it home now. He says, now, I do have to compliment you because, verse 6, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were professing Christians who were abusing grace. They thought grace was an excuse to sin. Because I have grace, I can just go do anything. He says, I know you hate that, so I, I want to commend you. I want to commend you. But this first love thing, watch this. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Pay attention now. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So I'm talking to the churches, but are you listening as an individual? He that hath an ear. She that hath an ear. So forget your neighbor right now. The question is, what are your ears picking up? He that hath an ear. So now it's an individual question, but being delivered to the whole congregation. Do you have an ear to hear? Well, everybody in here has ears, but you can have ears and not hear. He wants to know, are you paying attention to what is being said here about the primacy and prioritization of God in your life? And if you have an ear that is willing to hear and to reprioritize relationship over religion, devotion over duty, he says, if you have an ear, this is what happens to him who overcomes. To the one who overcomes. Overcomes what? Overcomes the pressure to not put me first. Because there's pressure sometimes to put God first. You've got to go against your inclinations. You've got to go against other people. You have to go against your schedule. You have to go against, your, there's pressure not to put him first. So you got to overcome that pressure. He says, if I am not going to be first, verse 5 says, I will remove your lampstand out of its place. You'll go to church, but I won't be there. No love, no light. You'll run your life, but I won't be hanging with you because I'm not going to hang with a believer who doesn't value me enough? Who else died for you? Who else paid for your sins? Who else has given you eternal destiny? Who else, has, who else do you call on when life shuts down on you? Well, if you 
think that they are your savior, go to them. Go to them. But if you really want me to be all out in a bag of chips, I need to be first. And to him who overcomes, the pressure not to put me first. To that one, to he, because he says he who overcomes. I'm going to reward her. He who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. I will grant the overcomer, not every Christian, because he's only talking to Christians here. So every Christian doesn't overcome, even though they are an overcomer. To he who overcomes that which Christ has already overcome for them, I will grant him to eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. He's speaking about a future reward that will come. But that future reward receives a down payment in this life. It's not all experienced here now because we live in a sinful world. What is this eating of the tree of life in the paradise of God? That I can begin to experience some of it now and much of it later. He will disclose himself beginning now. John 14, 21 says, to you and me. Now, if you've left your first love, the keys are still in the spot you left it. They haven't moved. So he's waiting on you to meet with him. Every day, every day. He's waiting for me. And, and I, I know what it is to, to lose that. One year, many years ago, we went on a family vacation to Niagara Falls. Drove up from Dallas to Niagara Falls. We got there at night, and Niagara Falls has an American side and a Canadian side. We went to the Canadian side. We went into the hotel at night. I pulled back the curtain, and I could see the falls in the distance, and I went, wow. They had lights on the falls, and, and uh, even though I was a long way away in the hotel room, I was just awed by the sight, even from a long distance. I just went, whoa. The next morning, we got up and had breakfast, and we went to the Canadian side of the falls. And on the Canadian side of the falls, there's a park. So we stood in the park. Oh, this was different than the hotel room. Hotel room, I couldn't hear a thing. I could just see it. But now I'm standing on the Canadian side and that water is going over the precipice and going into the basin of the falls and I could hear the thunder of the roar as the water splashed down in the falls and as the wind blew up the water, it actually crossed the street and I got dots of water on my face from the fall. You see, when I was in the hotel room, I could just see it and be impressed by it. But once I got a little closer to the park, I got affected by it because I could hear the sound and I got little drops of water on me. So I felt a little something, something because I had relocated myself. Oh, but there's another way you can see the falls. It's called the Maid of the Mist. These are little, little boats down in the basin of the fall. If you decide to get on the Maid of the Mist, they're going to give you a raincoat and they're going to give you an umbrella because you're about to be drenched by the falls because you are so close. See, some Christians are satisfied to see Jesus from their hotel room. They look out. They never hear from him. They never get to see him up close. They just impressed from a distance. And every now and then, they look his way. But then there are a few Christians who will come to the park. And they like the sound. And they will be a little closer. And every now and then, they'll feel a little something, something. But then there are those few Christians who are not satisfied to look at him from the hotel room. They're not satisfied to look at him from the park. They want a raincoat on. They want an umbrella over them because they want to be drenched by his glory. May God raise up saints who leave the hotel room, not satisfied with the park, but want to be drenched with his glory and overwhelmed by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords.
Did you know that some things God can't do? Oh yeah, some things God can't do. I know that may sound a little crazy, but think about it. The Bible says God cannot sin. Can't do that. The Bible says by two immutable things, it's impossible for God to lie. He can't do that. The Bible speaks about the fact that God exists in simplicity because he's spirit. So he can't be divided. Can't do that. Let me tell you something else God can't do. He can't be second. <laughs> he cannot be number two. Whenever you put God in second place, third place, fourth place, fifth place, or no place, then what you ask him to be a part of is something he cannot do. That's why there's so much in the Bible about idolatry, because you've, you've put some, something or someone next to him. He can't do that. And when you understand that God can't be second and therefore won't be second, that changes how you relate to him and how you prioritize him. Did you know there's some things God can't do? And one of them is he can't be number two. You and I must learn what it means to have God in first place. And you could be doing a lot of good things and he still not be first. Because he wants to be first relationally more than anything else. And when you prioritize making him first in the relationship, you have set in motion how the rest of your life can be operated in an orderly fashion. Because he got to break you in order to get all the good stuff in you to come out for your good and his glory. So somebody ought to praise him that he's a God who breaks us in order to make us. Hi, I'm Lois Evans. I'm Tony Evans. And I want to invite you to a Pastor's Wives Cruise in 2020, February 22nd through 29th. Save the dates. I want to see you there. Join me with my special friends. Our daughters are going to be helping me with the program. They're actually going to be speaking. Priscilla Shire, Crystal Evans Hurst, Debbie Titus, Mary the Shepherd, Rhoda Gonzalez, and then Carolyn Trail is going to bless us with her, her music. It's just going to be a wonderful time. So we want you to join us. And we want you to give your pastor's wife a yes. gift. A gift of rest, yes. relaxation, and rejuvenation. Yes. And spiritual encouragement, because that's what this special pastor's wife cruise is about. For Pastor's Appreciation Month, yes. appreciate her. Let her know she's valued. In fact, you can appreciate her husband and her and send them both yeah. for a great time together because they need to get away. They need to be encouraged. They need to network. They need to fellowship. And that's what this cruise is all about. While there won't be programming for husbands, there's going to be strategic program for wives. Yes. But there'll be time when husbands and wives can get together and enjoy each other and enjoy the fellowship that'll be on the cruise. So yeah. February 22nd and 29th, 2020, but you need to register now to get your place. It's going to be a great time. Give your pastor's wife a gift. She deserves it, yes. and she probably needs it. Yes, amen. Look forward to seeing you February 22nd. You already said that. To, to 29th. 29th. <laughs> yeah. Um, join us on our cruise. So register at loisevans.org slash cruise. I want to see you there. God bless you. I want to talk to you today about the process of brokenness. To encounter God's process of him stripping you of self-sufficiency so that you can experience a new level of his reality in your life and mine. Brokenness is when God intervenes in your life through a negative set of circumstances to attack a flaw in your personality. There is a flaw in your humanity that desperately needs to be addressed and he recognizes that at the core of it is independence and self-sufficiency and to strip you and me of it. 
he begins a process of breaking us. You have three parts to you. A body, a soul, and a spirit. First Thessalonians 5.23, you are made up of spirit, soul, and body. Your body allows you to function in the physical world through your five senses. Through the five senses, you are able to relate to the world around you. Your soul enables you to relate to yourself. Your soul is your personhood. The reason why you know you're you and that you're here is because you possess a soul which is the life principle that allows the body to operate. So your body allows you to function in the world. Your soul allows you to function with you. Your spirit allows you to function with God. So your spirit is God, your soul is you, and your body is the world around you. Everyone who is born into the world is born into the world with a scarred soul. Sin has scarred our soul. We're born in sin, shaped in iniquity. We are born flawed. Now that shows itself at different levels for different strokes for different folks, but there is a scarring of the soul. Some of that was transferred from your mother and your father, and that's why we find ourselves doing a lot of things our parents did because we picked up some of the scarring from them. You didn't just pick up their looks, you picked up their scars. And then the scarring is increased by things that happen to us, by circumstances that overwhelm us, by wrong done to us, by wrong done by us. All of this adds to the scarring of the soul. This scarring of the soul breeds independence from God. When a person accepts Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit invades their human spirit, giving them the ability to now receive spiritual data. When the Holy Spirit enters the human spirit, the human spirit, which is now infused by the Holy Spirit, invades the soul to transform it and get rid of the scars. He wants to strip away the scars of the soul, which causes us to do all the wrong things we do with our bodies. So we do wrong with our bodies because we got scars on our soul that the Spirit wants to heal so that we function in a way that brings God glory and brings us good. And so he must break us. But he's breaking us to remake us. In Genesis chapter 22, we have a breaking occurring in the life of the patriarch Jacob. Jacob has a name, and his name means trickster. His name means heel grabber. His name means supplanter. His name means deceiver. Jacob's name fits his character. In the Bible, names matter. We name people because we like the name. In the Bible, names were given to explain the character. Jacob was a born deceiver. From the time he left his mother's womb, he grabbed his brother, his twin brother, Esau's heel. Heel grabber. He tricked his brother out of his birthright. He comes to a crisis in chapter 32. The crisis is that it looks like his brother has gotten tired of him and he's going to kill him. In chapter 32, verse 6, it says, The messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to you from your brother Esau, and furthermore, he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed and he divided the people, it says, into two camps to try to make sure they didn't kill everybody. It says in verse 9, the next thing he did was say, 
oh God. Isn't that what you do when you get scared or no? Oh God, Lord have mercy. Oh God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, oh Lord, who said to me, return to your company and to your relatives and I will prosper you. I'm unworthy of all the stuff you've done for me, verse 10. And then he makes his request in verse 11, deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he will come and attack me and the mothers with the children. What happens? Verse 34. Then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Jacob is alone. He's alone because nobody he knows and nothing he knows can help him. He's by himself. You ever been in a situation where you were all alone? Oh, you, you may have had folk around you, but you might as well have been by yourself. Because nothing around you could make a difference. He's alone. He's by himself. He's been stripped. Now watch this. He's got a problem. His brother's after him. He prays to God. After he prays to God, things get worse. After he's talked to God, somebody shows up at night and wrestles him until daybreak. Verse 25. And when he, the stranger, saw that he, Jacob, had not prevailed against him. Mm. When this stranger saw that Jacob wasn't quitting, uh, that Jacob wasn't throwing in the towel, that Jacob wasn't giving up, that Jacob wasn't, wasn't just running away, when he saw he didn't prevail against him, he touched the socket of his thigh. And the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated when he wrestled with him. So the man had to disconnect something and make it worse. See, when God is trying to break you, he'll make it bad. But if you're not responding, he'll make it worse. He's trying to move your core, the thing that you are counting on to be able to deliver you. Verse 26, then he says, the stranger says, I didn't hurt you now, let me go. Okay, that means that Jacob was holding on, even with a dislocated hip. So he's hurting and holding. <laughs> you didn't miss that, did you? He's hurting and holding. It's easy when God is trying to break you to let go of God. It's easy when God is trying to strip you to say, I don't want it anymore. But Jacob said, you hurt me, but I'm still going to hold you. He says, I am not going to let you go. He says, I am not going to let you go, verse 26, until, somebody say until, you bless me. Wait a minute now. All we know, the stranger doesn't have a name. This guy has come at night when I'm already scared. This man is wrestling with me. Now this man has dislocated me and I've gone from trying to win a fight to trying to get a blessing. How do I move from fighting for my life to saying, bless me? Well, the only way you ask somebody to bless you is if you have the, know they have the ability to do that. When the stranger dislocates his hip, because it doesn't happen till then, when his strength is gone 
it dawns on Jacob, this is not a human match. It's a man, but it's not human. There's more to this battle than just the fight I'm in. I'm in the fight of my life, but there's more to this battle than the fight that I'm in. Something spiritual is occurring here. That's why he asked for a blessing. That's spiritual. So he recognizes, and he doesn't recognize it until the dislocation happens. That this is a spirit. So here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to mistake the hand of God for the hand of man. See, because he's wrestling a man, but he's really dealing with God. If all you see is what you see, you do not see all there is to be seen. God may use something physical to take you to a place that's spiritual. He may use something that you can see, touch, taste, smell, and hear when he's only invaded that to take you to a place that gets him to have your undivided attention. And if you try to push him off up here, he's going to touch something down there. And he will fight until you're hurt bad enough. I'm not going to let you go. Until you bless me. You know, many times in the scripture, Jesus would pretend like he was going to keep going. The disciples were on the water. They were struggling. Jesus was walking on the water. And when he got to the boat, it says, and he kept walking like he would pass them by. In Luke 24, it says, when the disciples on the man's road walked home and they finally got to their house, Jesus kept going until they invited him back. What Jesus is asking is, how bad do you want it? Do you really want me? Verse 27. So he said to him, uh, the man says to Jacob, what is your name? Okay, to follow this. I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. Oh, you want a blessing. Mm-hmm. What's your name? Remember, naming in the Bible refers to your nature, your character, not just your nomenclature. We do that with nicknames. Like we call somebody slim, that means they're skinny. So the nickname is reflecting something about them. You call somebody red because they got red hair. You know, the nickname is described. So we do with nicknames what they did with names. We make it descriptive. What's your name? Translation. Describe yourself to me. Are you willing to admit your name? Are you willing to acknowledge you are a deceiver? Because that's your name. Are you willing to acknowledge that you are a trickster? Are you willing to acknowledge you are a flawed person who has lived their lives Using evil to get by because it's all wrapped up in your name. But what God wants to know is are you willing to fess up to who you really are when you're alone with him? When you're wrestling with him? Now, your name may not be Jacob. Maybe your name is Liar. Maybe your name isn't Jacob, but your name is Cheetah. Maybe your name isn't Jacob, but maybe your name is Luster. Maybe your name isn't Jacob, but your name is Steeler. Maybe your name isn't Jacob, but maybe your name is Racist. What is your name? What is that character in your life that is against the will and character of God that keeps him from blessing you? And he will wrestle with you until you say your name. Even if he has to dislocate your hip to get there. What is your name? He says, my name is Jacob. I'm the deceiver.
verse 28. He says, your name shall no longer be Jacob. I'm going to change your name, meaning I'm going to change your character. But your name will now be Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Ooh. God says, I got a new reality for you, Jacob, and that new reality is you're going to experience what it looks like when I run the show in your life. God prevails. You're going to experience what it looks like when I show up to turn something around because it's God's prevail. You won't have to live your life with trickery anymore. You won't have to be a deceiver anymore. You won't, you won't have to try to fix it yourself anymore because I'm going to change your name. See, some of us have a name called education because we think because we got a BA and an MBA and a PhD that my education has made me self-sufficient. Well, I'm going to tell you now, God's going to change your name. Some of us have a name called money because we define our sufficiency by our bank account and by our credit cards. But I want to tell you now, if you want to experience God, he's going to try to change your name. Some of us have a name called uh, relationships because we got all the hookups we need to get to where we want to go, do what we want to do, but be what we want to be. But if you want to experience God, he's going to change your name by letting the relationships fall through and not being able to pull off what you thought they would be able to pull off. In order to experience God, he will strip you of your name in order for you to know that God prevails. That the spiritual trumps the physical and that you and I are not sufficient within ourselves. Verse 29. Then Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. You asked me my name. Tell me your name. Listen to the man's response. But he said, why is it that you ask me my name? See, a lot of us get like Marvin Gaye. What's going on? God says, you ought to know by now. <laughs> Everything you didn't try, I didn't blocked. Every contact you made, I didn't stopped. Every time you think you don't have, have any more debts, I let something else break down. You ought to know my name by now. It ought to be clear who you're dealing with. And so it dawned on him. So Jacob named the place, verse 30, Peniel, for he said, I have seen God. He knew his name now. I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved because he could have killed me. See, if you only knew what God could do, that he didn't do, doesn't do. Some of us should be dead right now. But because of the goodness, grace, and favor of God, he brought you out, brought you through when you were thinking you were going to lose your mind. He said, I've seen God face to face and I'm alive to talk about it. So if you're still here, he ain't finished. Oh, but here's where it gets good. Here's where it gets good. Let's bring it to a close. Here's where it gets good. Now, verse 131. The sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Penuel, and he was limping on his thigh. Because Hebrews 11 verse 21 says that when he blessed his grandchildren, in order to bring them blessing, he had to lean on his staff. So years later, he's still limping. Years later, he's still limping. So if, ja if Jacob came on the stage today and you say, why are you limping? Jacob would have to say, I'm limping because I've been blessed. I'm limping because I've been blessed because a few years ago, 
I was independent. I was self-sufficient. I made it happen all by myself. God broke me down. He separated my socket. And every time I get up and try to go somewhere, I'm reminded about my weakness. I'm reminded about my dependency. I'm admired, I'm, I'm minded, reminded that I can't make it without him. Every step I take, every move I make, God is reminding me, you better not get the big head, boy, because you do have another hip. if I have to so you better remember you are totally dependent on me and he says and I've been blessed but what was the blessing when he said I want to be blessed he wasn't talking about something general he was talking about verse 13 where he says you promised that you would make of me a great name and you would give me a great land you see your blessing is something God has already planned to do in the past that he's not free to do yet because you are not broke down far enough for him to be free to do it. So the blessing is not something new, it's something old that becomes new to you when you are made, made ready to receive it. So some of us in here need to start limping and say, God, I'm going to break my own socket so you don't have to break my socket so that I can be totally dependent on you. Look, in closing, if you remember years ago when you were growing up, they used to have them piggy banks. They used to have them piggy banks with a little slit at the top, and you would put your coins in the piggy bank to save your money. When it was time to get your money, you shook the piggy bank. You took the pig, you turned it upside down, and you shook it. 
Now, the reason you shook it was because there was something valuable on the inside that you wanted to come to the outside. And so you shook it. The harder it was to come out, the harder you shook it. Because you wanted the money, but it was stuck on the inside and you needed it on the outside, so you shook it. After a while, you got tired of shaking it because it wasn't coming out like you wanted to. So you went and got a hammer and you took the hammer and you broke the piggy bank because you got tired that it wasn't responding to the shaking. God will start by shaking you because there's something valuable in you. But if you don't respond to the shaking, he goes to get a hammer because he got to break you in order to get all the good stuff in you to come out for your good and his glory. So somebody ought to praise him that he's a God who breaks us in order to make us. Recently in Kenya, I had a divine encounter. It was a missions trip. And while I was invited to benefit others, they benefited me by letting me see in a foreign land how real God could be. And so I got impacted because I met God at a new level. And that's what God wants from each of us. He wants for each of us to have a divine encounter with him that takes us above the normal and the ordinary and runs a smack dab into the extraordinary. The Bible is full of divine encounters. Moses encountered God at the burning bush. Abraham encountered God when he was told to do the unthinkable to sacrifice his own son. Elijah encountered God when God provided through a widow an unexpected source. Jacob encountered God when he had to wrestle and get his name changed and his character fixed. So look for God to give you the opportunity to encounter him. It will not come through the normal. It will come through the extraordinary. It will come through the unexpected. But it's always designed to give you a bigger, more personal experience with him. Divine Encounters, look for yours because it will forever change your life. Chân đây, chân đây, nào mình cùng nhảy lo con. 